welcome all. I hope you guys are having a great day. I hope this does nothing to change that. How are you guys today? Right, okay, so uh, again, uh, do me a favor at some point, check to see that your D2L grade actually reflects uh, the test corrections that you did. How do you know? Check D2L. And hopefully that uh, hopefully they're there because I had to enter them in manually. Um, they can't do it formally, which is ridiculous. Um, so it's possible that I screwed it up, or it's possible that I didn't enter them well in because at some point I was bitter and cranky, um, more than normal. Um, so today I wanted to talk about optics uh, and optical devices. If you're in the lab class and uh, and you did this lab on I guess that was yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my apologies. In fact, I think we're going to be behind for today and tomorrow, and then I should probably be able to get us caught up. Um, to the lab again. But, uh, so we've talked about uh, a light as a wave, right? In fact, uh, this is a long, long, long running question throughout, uh, throughout human history as to, as to whether light was a wave or light was a particle. Um, this, the, I don't know if you've ever heard the expression, you know, giving someone an evil eye. If you've not heard of the expression, I know you're at least familiar with the concept because I um, look out into the audience from time to time. Um, but, uh, this dates back to, to kind of a, an era where, where light was thought to be streamers, something that emitted from your eye. So when you look at something, you know, the thought was that perhaps you emitted these streamers and they bounced off of whatever you were looking at. Uh, and that's, that was this idea of vision. And so this idea of, you know, the evil eye was that Maybe along with those streamers, you could send out some, some really vicious thoughts. Um, you make a cranky look on your face, right? Um, and at least, uh, you know, that's fallen out of favor, that, that particular interpretation, right? Uh, but uh, as we'll come to see over the, the next few lectures, uh, various experiments have demonstrated wave nature of, of light and, and at least hinted at particle nature of light. Um, and eventually we'll get to, to perhaps some, some stronger arguments on both sides. But, uh, but the, the ones that we've seen thus far in lecture have been stuff like uh, light undergoes interference effects, right? Um, in fact, if you, um, you know, a very, very simple way of, of examining this is if you look at a bright light source like one of the, the lamps or maybe one of these, you put your thumb and forefinger next to one another, you'll see this weird fringing shatter, shadow pattern. Um, just before they touch. And what you're really seeing is, is interference of light. And, and so we'll, um, waves undergo interference. Particles don't, right? Waves undergo interference. And so, so this seemed to be pretty strong indication that light was a wave. Um, and so, so at least for the time being, we're going to, to view light as a wave. 
especially for our optics discussions. Um, and then we'll, maybe we'll come back and, and uh, address this again in a couple days. But, uh, there's a couple of ways that you can think of, uh, think of light and, uh, or at least the travel of light. Uh, one is to think of like little wavelets. That that the wave front is composed of the line tangent to a whole bunch of little uh, wavelets, and that each point on the wave front consists of, again, these tiny little pieces. Each of them, you can think of like seeds, right? Each of these has the potential to, to carry all the information of a wave, so that if So there's the new wave front. If instead we brought this up to, to some barrier, with a little defect in it, well, what you would see here is kind of this spreading wave, right? If you've ever passed like a a water wave through a small barrier. Um, you've probably seen something like this. And, and so this is maybe one way of, of giving yourself a, a mental image of, of how a wave is propagating. Another way that you can think of wave propagation uh, is, is owed to, uh, to Vermont. Uh, Vermont's probably best known for Vermont's last theorem. You guys familiar with this? Vermont's last theorem is one of the great, you can either think of it as one of the great mysteries in math or perhaps one of the great jokes in math. Um, so, you guys know Pythagorean theorem? Yeah. What's Pythagoras' theorem? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Um, so Vermont, on his deathbed, not really on his deathbed, but shortly before he died, said, I have a proof. So this is in the day where, you know, before journals, um, now a lot of science and math is uh, new breakthroughs are conveyed in, in journals. Um, but in, in his era, it was conveyed by letter. And so before he died, he sent out a bunch of letters to his friends and colleagues saying, I have devised a proof that a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n has no solution, no integer solutions for n greater than 2. And then he died without telling anyone how he'd done it. And And people spent a few hundred years, mathematicians spent a few hundred years trying to, to recreate this, this proof. I think it was in like the 19, early 1980s when, with the use of fractals, a, a branch of mathematics that you know, didn't exist for 250 years after Vermont's death, um, were able to, to give a proof for this. And so the, the question then becomes, well, you know, did Fermat actually prove this, or did he just, you know, perhaps try it a bunch of times and say, yeah, yeah, close enough? Doesn't seem like Fermat, but who was a you know brilliant mathematician. Uh, but at least the way that we know how to solve this problem involves math that that didn't exist during that time. And so you would think that if if he had Use fractals to prove this. That uh, 
that he would have sent a letter off to his friends saying, hey, I've discovered fractals. Um, but uh, regardless, he also did a lot of work in physics. And so Fermat has this principle of least time. And the, the principle of least time says that If you connect points A and B, light will take the, the path that gets it from point A to point B in the shortest period of time. And so how does light know to do that? I don't know. Uh, again, this is, this is a model. It's not exactly, um, we're, we're not saying that either of these is exactly what's going on. But, As kind of an analogy, an analogous situation, imagine that you have uh, an open top shoebox, like a shoebox without the lid. And you've got a little ant here. Would you guys have guessed ant? Um, some sort of. If the ant wants to go from here to here, what's the what's the shortest path? What's the what's the shortest path that the ants can take? So the ant's going to have trouble walking a straight line exactly because uh, because from here to here is air. So one possible path is straight down and then straight across, right? Is that, um, as it turns out, that's not quite the shortest path. If we unfold this, right? So if I, if I took scissors and just sliced the walls and unfolded it, we can imagine that the ant's either here or here. Um, the, the arguments pretty much similar either way. Um, but you can imagine that the, the shortest path from here to here is, I don't know, going to be one of those two, right? But if you, uh, if you unfold this, that means either walking first a little bit this way, and then this way, or maybe walking first a little bit this way and that way, right? Does that? Somehow, light does something similar in Fermat's framework. It takes the shortest path in terms of time, not necessarily the shortest path in terms of distance. But the, the shortest path in terms of time. Um, and so let's see if so I want to return to our discussion of, of refraction. Do you guys remember what was refraction? It's the bending of light when what happened? When light goes from, or from, when one, when a wave goes from one medium into a medium where it travels at a different speed, hooray! Do you guys remember what reflection was? It's like an echo. It's the, it's the bouncing of a wave at the interface between two media, right? Between two different media. Is that all right? Um, you might remember that I talked about this in terms of marching bands before when we were talking about refraction. Um, and I think the, the mediums that I used when we were doing this were uh, concrete and mud for a marching band, is that right? Uh, so let's say that light can travel fast in medium one 
like our concrete, right? And it travels slow and medium too, like our marching band walking in the mud. Let's say that it starts out here and wants to get to here. Now, we might be tempted might be tempted to use a ruler the next time we want to draw a straight line. Um, we might be tempted to take that path, right? However, as it turns out, this isn't necessarily the, the quickest way of getting from point A to point B. Can you, can you imagine why? This might be awesome. So, Could you slow down? I slow down. So imagine that, um, imagine that I'm at the beach, and I see a Milky Way candy bar off in the water, right? It's slowly sinking. We have to save the Milky Way candy bar. Uh, it's still wrapped, otherwise I, would, I just let it sink. Well, so the, the question is, am I a faster runner or am I a faster swimmer? I'm a faster runner. I'm a much slow, I'm a really slow swimmer. Um, so my choices could be to run straight down and then straight over. If Let's say this is uh, the sand and this is the water. Is this a good idea? No. Why not? <clears throat> I'm a slow swimmer, right? And I'm making the distance that I have to swim big and the distance I'm running pretty small. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, we could also imagine maybe doing something like this, where I keep the swim as short as possible, but now I'm, I'm uh, making the, the total distance pretty big, right? And so you, you might imagine that there's a happy medium somewhere in between. That happy medium is to definitely try and do more running than I am swimming, right? But but to not keep the the distance at a forever path even for my run. Does that make sense? So, in this Fermat notion of, of light takes the fastest path it can from point A to point B, what he's arguing is somehow light knows all of these different possible paths, and the one it chooses is the one that minimizes the time. That's the principle of least time. And, and it does a good job of explaining refraction. Does that work for you guys? So those three in red, is that purple or blue? Either way. Um, the three in red are not the fastest paths. The, uh, the fastest path does involve a little bit of extra running to shorten the swim. Uh, but you don't want to go crazy with the run, right? I could take this to an absurd extreme and take the, you know, I could run this way, <coughs> oh, sure. and then that way, right? That doesn't, just increasing the run just to increase the run's sake is, is yeah. So the Milky Way is our state. <clears throat> if light is a weight, can you grab a similar wave and cancel it out? Yes. Um, so that's what I was saying, if you, 
Um, so we haven't discussed uh, diffraction yet, but if you make a, a narrow slit with your thumb and forefinger, uh, you'll see a weird fringing shadow. And what you're seeing there is interference of light. The bright lines are corresponding to, uh, to constructive interference, where they're adding together. Uh, the, the dark lines in the shadow word are corresponding to the destructive interference. Questions, comments, concerns? You guys hanging in there? Additionally, uh, you could use this principle of least time to explain, so if this is a mirror, to explain reflection. If I want to, to go from point A to point B, there's a whole bunch of, of paths that I could take. And and as it turns out, do you guys remember what the law of reflection said? Mm -hmm. So the law of reflection told us that the instant angle was equal to the reflected angle. And as it turns out, since we're always going to stay on one side, the, the speed in the medium is always going to be the same. And so in this case, the shortest time is going to correspond to the shortest distance. And the shortest distance is going to occur when the instant angle and the reflected angle are the same with respect to this normal, where it hits the, the blue. Yeah. Why doesn't it just travel the straight line? Well, it does do that as well. But if I'm getting, if I'm going off of the mirror, oh. the the shortest path is uh, is the one that keeps the instant of reflected angles. Are we okay with this? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let's talk about optical devices a little bit. Well, actually, let me talk about diffraction before I do that. Um, so we talked about reflection. We were happy with that. It's probably the one that everyone's most familiar with. We talked about refraction. That's the, uh, the bending of the wave as it crosses from one medium into a different medium, where the speed is different. The last one on our list is diffraction. Anyone know what diffraction is? So diffraction is just the bending, and this is kind of a, a loose definition. It's a it's a, a working definition. The bending of the wave to get around an obstacle. a mirror is I, I kind of draw the, the glass side with dashed lines. Is that alright? So if I put an 
object, and my object is just going to be an error because I'm not really a good enough artist to do anything else. So when I'm talking about a mirror, am I caring about reflection, refraction, or diffraction? Mirrors are for reflection, yeah? Um, so I'm going to apply the law of reflection here. And typically what we do is we, we treat light as though it was rays. We assume it's traveling in straight lines. Certainly, uh, it's a straight line until it gets to a medium, a different medium. So this ray that comes straight in from the tip and hits the mirror, what does that one do? What's the law of reflection tell me again? It's going to be the instant angle. The instant angle is the same as the reflected angle. So this one has an angle of zero with respect to the normal. And so what's the angle of reflection? It's going to come back. My brain is going to pretend that this has just been traveling forever in a straight line. That's not a very straight line. That ray. Yeah? I'm going to draw other rays, too. So I'm going to put my, my observer back here. That's my badly drawn human eye, sorry. Oh. We're also going to draw a second ray. I like this to it doesn't have to, but I'd like second rays right here. What is this one? So can you help me find the instant angle here? So it's just that, right? That's theta instant. And so can you help me determine what the reflected angle is going to be then? So which way is it going to go? Well, it's going to go up. It's going to go up. Like, diagonal. Or down. Yeah. So this one is going to come like so. So that would be they reflected. Yeah? What is this like on a flat plane or like up here? So this is just a flat mirror, okay. right? A shining. Uh, you have a, a lit up arrow in front of a flat mirror. Well, how would you say that? Like, because like, if I read it like a graph, and I would say it would be negative, but like the negative one. Ah, uh, so the only rule that we're going to need to apply is that. Whatever angle this instant makes with reflect with respect to the normal mm -hmm. of the mirror is going to be the reflected angle. Mm -hmm. So whatever that is, we just reflect it across the normal in the same sense. My brain wants to believe that light travels in straight lines, and so this light has just been traveling forever and always. That's the way my brain interprets stuff. So I get something like that. Where these two cross is where my brain assumes that the image came from. And so my brain assumes that there is, so if this is the object, this is the image. Does that work for you guys? Is there actually any light back here behind my bathroom mirror? No. No. Right? It's in, in my wall. Right? So if I'm standing... By the way, notice that I was very careful. And the distance the object is in front of the flat mirror is also the distance that the image is behind the mirror. Right? So if I stand two feet in front of my bathroom mirror. Believe it or not, I did this on purpose. I stood in front of a mirror. I combed my hair. I did this purposefully, right? Mirror, comb, and everything. 
If I stand two feet in front of my bathroom mirror, where do I see my image? Two feet behind the mirror. Yeah? If instead I was standing three feet away, then I would see the image also take a step back. Please. So I have a question. Please. What happens when you get a mirror on this side and a mirror on that side? And then you like, like how do, how do you know when it stops the reflection? Because I've, I've done that. It just keeps going. It just keeps going. Yeah, the light just keeps bouncing back and forth. Every time it bounces off the mirror, oh. Um, so I'm pretending that you get 100% reflection. You don't. There's a little bit of refraction. Some of the light actually passes through the mirror, but not much if it's a good mirror. And so, um, so what happens in practice is that every successive reflection is a little dimmer than the last one, because mm -hmm. you're losing a little bit of the light. But in a, in a perfect idealized sense, there's no loss, and it, it just keeps reflecting back and forth. Are we doing OK? Um, so this is what happens with a flat mirror. And there's a couple of things that I want to point out. Uh, there's no light actually here, right? This is just what my brain is assuming, because what's my brain actually, what, what is the eye detecting, and what signal is it sending to, the, to my brain? What is it actually finding? Well, it's seeing this guy, right? And this guy. These two, I'll call it one and two. My brain puts these together and says, well, I see these two rays diverging. And I'm, diverging means spreading apart, right? And so I'm going to assume that at some point, they must have diverged from the same point, and so that's where the image should be, right? Does that make sense? And so there's not actually light coming from this point. Does that work for you guys? Mm -hmm. If there's no light actually coming from this point, we call it a virtual image. It's virtual because there's not actually light there. If I were to put my hand there, or a card there, or a camera there, and try and record whatever was right here, photo sensor, there's nothing there. And so we're going to call this a virtual image. Is it upright, or is it inverted? Is it the same as the object, or is it inverted from the object? So it is upright because they both, both arrows point upwards. So it is a virtual image, it is upright, and if I had done this a little better, eh, it's not terrible. It should also not be magnified, it should be the same size as this. <coughs> is that alright? Mm -hmm. So you said it's virtual because it's... It's virtual because if I put my hand here, or I put a photo detector here, uh, or if you were on the other side of the wall, uh, and I'm standing in front of the mirror, you don't see any light. You don't see my image. At least not where, where my brain tells me the image is. My brain says that I see an image of myself three feet behind the mirror, but there's, there's not actually light coming from three feet behind the mirror. Are we doing all right with this? Yes, no, maybe so. Pull In the lab, I forget what virtual was, but I thought it was virtual. Hi. It's probably a variant of what you've got in lab. So, hi. Uh, the, the basic idea here is uh, whether light is actually diverging from the point where you see the image. We're all right with this. Okay. So let's look at something maybe one step more complicated, which is what happens once we start looking at curved mirrors. So so I'm going to start with something simple. And it's 
it's actually the most complicated case that we'll talk about. Um, of a spherical section of mirror. So imagine that we took this ball and we somehow spray painted it uh, with uh, with like silver and then polished it until it was good and smooth and then lifted the the silver half sphere off, right? Does that make sense? We're okay with this? All right. So we would have something like this, depending on whether we went for the half sphere or some, some smaller segment. Right. I'm going to refer to this as a concave mirror. And I'm going to call it the concave mirror. The, the other version is the convex. The, the mnemonic that I use for this, the memory aid that I use for this, is the concave one is the one that you could walk into, right? It's also the side of the, the spoon that, that holds soup, right? One side of the spoon holds soup. The other side, if you pour the soup on, it just rolls off. The concave one is the side that holds soup. In my weird, twisted sense, um, I, I always remember this as like, I could pour soup into a cave and it would stay, right? Mm -hmm. But if I were to pour it over a boulder, it would just kind of roll off. One of those shapes is, is concave, the other is convex. Convex, I don't have a good memory for. I just know it's the one that's not concave. Yeah? I love mnemonic twice this night. As you go through your education, um, I don't know if your brain is wired as oddly as mine, but uh, memory aids um, are invaluable as far as I'm concerned. And uh, when I was a little kid, I learned the Galilean moons of, of Jupiter. Um, Galileo, with one of his early telescopes, was able to see uh, the the four inner moons of Jupiter, which are barely sizable. Um, Jupiter has 60-something moons, I think, by today's count. But, um, but, you know, four of them are big enough that Galileo could see with a kind of modest telescope. Uh, and they are Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Um, and the mnemonic I learned for this one as a little kid was, I eat green carrots. Um, and I don't even really eat orange carrots, but the idea of green carrots, this, this has stuck with me forever to the point that um, I think I'll, for the rest of my life, be able to remember I eat green carrots, I owe Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Uh, mnemonic devices, is very useful. You know, it seems goofy, especially if you stand in front of a room full of people and acknowledge your weird uh, mnemonic devices. You don't have to go that far, but use the modified. All right, so again, I'm going to try and draw kind of the center line of this mirror, just give myself a central axis. And once again, I'm going to, so you can imagine. kind of what this uh, whole sphere would look like, I could draw the center right there. And then there's something that we're going to call the focal point. And the focal point is basically halfway from the, the middle of the mirror to the, the center of the curvature. So we're going to do this two ways. First, we're going to put an object outside of the focal point. Yay? I want to envision two cases here for this mirror. And so the first one, this time, 
the ray comes in. Notice that the, the law of reflection still holds. But this time, rather than a flat mirror, I have a curved mirror. If I have, so do you guys know perpendicular to the, a line perpendicular to the, the surface of a sphere passes through what point on the sphere? So if I have a, imagine the spokes of a bicycle tire, wheel, tire, wheel. Um, the, the spokes are perpendicular to the, the tire surface, right? But the spoke passes through what point? What point do they all pass through? The center, right? So if I were to draw the normal here, where would it pass through? It would pass through the center. And so what does the law of reflection tell me? The instant angle, so if we were, again, sketching our to the reflected. have to equal the reflected angle. And so this one does something like that. Right. This is our first rule for drawing these sketches. A ray that comes in parallel to the axis on our concave mirror gets reflected such that it passes out through the focal point. So a ray that comes in parallel to the axis gets reflected out through the focal point. just a, a, a geometric rule for our spherical section mirror. We get into a little trouble if we let this extend too close to a hemisphere. But as long as you stick close to the axis, a ray that comes in parallel to the axis gets reflected out through the focal point. Yay? We have the the corollary to this, which is that if a ray comes in parallel, sorry, passes through the focal point, it comes out parallel to the axis. All right. So it comes out parallel to So the if it passes through the focal point, it comes out parallel to the axis. Before we were saying if it comes in parallel to the axis, it reflects through the focal point. This time we're saying if it passes through the focal point on its way to being reflected, it will reflect out parallel to the axis. Does that work for you guys? I need one more. I'm hoping that I have one more. Can you guys see that? Is that? That's okay. Right. The last one that I'm going to include is the last one that I'm going to include is what happens if comes in and strikes the center of the mirror, it reflects out just like this was a flat wall, right? Instant angle is equal to, norm, uh, to reflected angle with respect to the normal. All right. All three of these meet at the same point, and so where am I going to see the image this time? Well, this time I'm going to get an image out here. Does that work for you guys? Mm -hmm. Yes, no, maybe so. Yeah. The, so 
this is the label of them again. The object. And this is the the image. This time, if I put my hand here, does light actually land on my hand? No. Yeah, it absolutely does. So this time, light reflects onto my hands. If this one was a virtual image, then I'm going to call this one a real image. Because if I put my hand there, light is actually landing. That's all right? Is this one upright or inverted? This one is inverted. So we have an inverted real image. And this one is magnified. And in physics, we mean something a little weird by magnified. What we mean is it, it's just not the same size as the original object. It could be bigger, it could be smaller. Both of those would count as magnified. Is that all right? Are you guys doing OK with this? Questions, comments, concerns? Let's look at this again. Again, we're going to use the concave mirror. This time, though, I want to put the object inside of the, the focal length. It's between the focal length and the mirror. Is that all right? And so, again, our rule was if it comes in parallel, what does it do? It reflects through the focal point. Yay? Yeah. Um, if it So I can see that those two guys aren't going to, to cross on my side of the mirror, right? If I put the, the badly drawn human eye up here again. And so what do I have to do? Well, I have to imagine that these guys are doing something like that. There was one more that we could draw. We don't have to. The two crossing is enough, but we could draw one more, and it would still be okay. Um, we could draw one that seems like it came through the focal point. That's not the color I was using. Draw one that seems like it came from the focal point. What does this one do? Well, this one reflects out parallel to the axis. And lo and behold, those don't actually all cross at the exact same spot, but close enough. So this is the image this time. Is it real or virtual? virtual. It's a virtual image. How did you know? If I put my hands there, no lights landing there. It's behind the mirror, right? Is it upright or inverted? It is upright. Is it magnified? Yes. I'm guessing that many of you have a version of this mirror in your house. Um, we have one in my house, which I avoid like the plague. Um, it's a it's called a vanity mirror. Um, And 
it gives you a, a magnified upright image of your face. So I don't know if you're trying to put eyeliner on or something, um, or if I just want to feel bad about myself and see every pore and wrinkle and uh, gray hair and who is that person in the mirror, um, that's the mirror to go to, right? That's the, that's the one. Um, please. Do you do the continuance of the rays behind the mirror as, because it's in the direction of the, what the Because eyes? none of these uh, cross out here. I have to make them cross because that's where they cross is where we're going to say the images. And so since they're, this one is spreading apart from that one and this one is spreading apart from that one, I know that they, they're not going to meet on this side of the mirror and so I'm going to just trace them back until they do meet somewhere. Right. What I'm saying is so just take your first that went actually through the focal point. Yes. So you continued going up behind the mirror. Because what my brain always is going to assume is that light travels in a straight line forever and always. Okay, so you did it. And so of that I line. just kept that going that way. This one was going this way, and so I draw that straight backwards. This one is going this way, and so I'm going to draw that straight backwards. Um, okay. I just extend each of these lines <laughs> until they meet somewhere. Okay. Whether it's in front of the mirror, so notice here I only drew this one about that long, I had to extend it. Um, you just have to extend the line in a straight line until, until it intersects. In the way that I like to do this, and this isn't you know, something you have to do, but the way that I like to do this is if it's on the real side of the mirror, I use solid lines. If it's on the virtual side of the mirror, I use dashed lines. And so when the dashed lines meet, I know, oh yeah, that's a, that's a virtual image. When these solid lines all met, I knew that that was a real image. When these dashed lines met, so again, this came in this way and then bounced back that way. I just assumed it kept coming from somewhere off in the distance there. This one, when it reflected, it's coming this way, and so I just assumed that it was coming from way up here, right? Mm -hmm. But where those dashed lines meet was right. Okay. Ernestina, yes, ma'am. I'm bad with colors, but this oh. one's the orange one, right? Oh, it's like probably the most similar. This one. Yeah, I can't see the right. So I drew one straight in. I tried to color code this, and I think even in my color blindness I got it. But um, the straight line in passes through the focal point. So here I had a straight line in, and it passed through the focal point. Oh, okay. Yay? So, if you have a concave mirror, something interesting happens. If you're outside of the focal point, if you're further away from the focal point, what you're going to see is an upside down image of yourself, but it's going to be a real image. If you're inside of the focal point, if you're closer to the mirror than the focal point, you're going to see an upright image, but it's virtual. It's behind the mirror, and it will be magnified. Hooray. Not hooray? Kind of hooray. Okay. Let's look at a convex mirror really quickly, and then we'll talk about uh, lenses. We'll talk about glass. myself some axis. Um, and again, we can extend this, find the center, and then the focal point. I'm going to draw a pair of focal points for this. I don't really need both, I'm just going to draw both. Um, 
output my object here. And this time again we're drawing a ray that comes in parallel to the axis. I can use that. Again I want to find the normal, remember. And so the normal is the line that goes from that point to the to the center of curvature. And so I can extend that. So which way is this thing going to reflect? If I draw the one that comes in straight towards the center, what does this one do? It reflects just out like so, yeah? And so again, the thing that my eye takes note of are this guy one and this guy two, right? Do those cross on the real side of the mirror? No, they do not. They're spreading apart, right? Yay? And so, I have to trace this one backwards. And so where do they cross? They cross on the virtual side, right? So there's the image. Does that work for you guys? Can you see that? Oh, maybe hold the face a little bit. Is it real or virtual? It is a virtual image. Is it upright or inverted? It is upright. Is it magnified? Remembering in physics, we have that weird definition that it's magnified so long as it's not the same size as the original. It is magnified. I will tell you that it's always smaller. Where have you seen one of these? Ever walk into a 7-Eleven? Yeah. Oh. Ever feel like they were being watched the whole time? Um, they tend to have, or maybe in a parking garage, if you have to go around a, a blind corner, they'll put up one of those rounded mirrors that's rounded outwards. That's what you're seeing here, right? Gives you a, a, a smaller view. And this will be true whether you're outside the focal point or inside. I'd like to put it so that I have some sense of scale. How are we doing? Questions, comments, concerns? Yes, ma'am. Why, why did you try to draw the blue dotted line from the center outward? This guy. Yeah. Uh, 